So hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Encore Live. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to travel to London with us. Before we get started, I just wanted to mention a few notes on the setup of the event. I'm sure everyone's quite familiar with Zoom by now, <laughs> especially for those of you who have attended uh, previous events with us. However, I did just want to mention that the webinar format is slightly different than a, a normal Zoom meeting. All attendees are muted, and unfortunately, you can see us, but we can't see you. However, we do want, to be, want this to be as interactive as possible, so please use the Q&A function to ask any questions that you might have during the event, and then we'll do our best to answer them uh, by the end of the webinar when we'll actually have a, a Q&A session. Um, additionally, I did want to tell you that this is being recorded, and it will be available to watch on our blog as soon as tomorrow, so please feel free to watch it again or share it with anyone that's interested. We're happy to, to uh, share the love. <laughs> All right. Well, we will get started now. For those of you who don't know, my name is Sabrina Nikoloff. I'm a regional director here at Encore Tours. And today we're going to spend the next half hour or so taking a tour around London and the surrounding area. London has long been a very popular and successful tour destination, of course, for Encore groups. Not only is it easily accessible, but it's also one of the most beautiful cities in Europe and one of my favorites, of course. Home to a number of world-renowned composers, England has such a rich history of music and culture, many wonderful performance venues, and consistently strong audiences. Today we're going to discuss the past, present, and future of music in England. And to help us guide, guide us through the journey, we are joined today by three wonderful guests who I'm honored to introduce to you. Please welcome Jill Hutton from our London office. Hello, Jill. Hello. Hi, everybody. Wonderful to have you here. Yeah, it's lovely to be here. Great fun. Great fun. <laughs> Fantastic. And then I'd like to introduce Valda Kamp from our London office as well. Hello, Valda. Hello, Hello Sabrina. Hello, everybody. <laughs> and uh, thirdly, we, welcome, we are joined today by Rachel Pearson, who's not only a Blue Badge guide, but also a member of the London Concert Choir. Hello, Rachel. Hello. Hi, Sabrina. Thank you so much for inviting me along today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you. Absolutely. Uh, so Rachel will serve as our virtual guide and presenter in our first two videos, and she'll help answer any questions that you might have about these venues or the, the current state of affairs in London. And then we'll move on to a pre-recorded interview with famous John Rutter, uh, who he, had, and he prepared this video especially for us today, which is quite an honor. We're so excited to show you this video. Uh, it really brings forth not only his incredible talent, but also his truly lovely personality. So that would be a wonderful way to, to end the event. All right, so let's get started. Uh, my first question to you, Rachel, I wanted to start kind of with a broad question and just uh, ask why London is such a popular destination for touring ensembles. I've been giving this a lot of thought actually. Why is London such a popular destination? And I've come up with three main reasons. And I think we've already touched on a couple of these already just in the introduction. Um, but the first has to be our great array of venues. I mean, we just have such um, a, a good mix of venues, everything from intimate halls to your great concert venues and stages. Um, for groups to perform in and of course that gives you a different dynamic with audiences and a different kind of acoustics depending on the venue that you pick um, and then also just the array of musical genres that are on display and available to people at any given time you can go to a West End show to catch some of the colorful songs there you can go to the opera go to a jazz session um, Everything from gospel choirs, of course, to more traditional um, church music as well. And then there's the history and heritage, the musical history and heritage, which you've already referred to and which we'll touch on uh, a bit later as well. Um, and I think groups pick up on this and they're excited to be here when they perform in London. Absolutely. Thank you. It's, it is such a fantastic place to visit for so many reasons. Um, and as you mentioned, the, you know, the historic nature of the venues, um, one of the, the places I think of uh, for sure is Westminster Abbey, which is at the top of the list and just such a significant part of 
UK's musical heritage. And Rachel, I know that you've prepared a video about the history of this venue and of um, some English composers. And as our virtual tour guide, I was wondering if you could please tell us a little bit about this video. Well, it would, it would have been a shame to miss Westminster Abbey out. I mean, we couldn't hold a webinar like this and not talk about Westminster Abbey. Um, again, groups love touring Westminster Abbey because of its musical heritage, because of its royal connections, and because of the fact its history underpins so much of London's history as well. Every king and queen has been crowned there since William the Conqueror. Um, it's also the final resting place of some of the great composers of choral music, which we'll hear a little bit about in the video. And if you, and when you, hopefully, come to London, you can tour the Abbey, but you can also attend the services there. And if you're into your choral music, then Evensong is really one of the most beautiful services to attend from that perspective. Um, so if we're all ready, why don't we play the first video? I'm Rachel Pearson. I'm a Blue Badge tourist guide and I'm also a member of the London Concert Choir. As a nation, the UK has a rich musical heritage that ranges from Edward Elgar to the Beatles, from bagpipes to electric guitars, and from Glastonbury to the proms. We have embraced all sorts of musical traditions over the centuries. One of the genres we are particularly known for is our choral music. And it seems fitting to talk about that outside a building that is not only the final resting place for many of the great composers of that genre, but has also acted as a venue for several performances of choral pieces over the years. And that building is, of course, Westminster Abbey. For over a thousand years, music has accompanied services that have taken place here at the Abbey. This is largely because the historical roots of choral music come from early Christian traditions. Today, this tradition continues, and the Abbey is proud to have a world-class choir that comprises 24 boys, or choristers, and 12 adult singers. English choral music began as unaccompanied plain song that clergy could chant during services. From this primitive start, composers developed the simple tunes into the vivid array of works that we have today. There are too many composers to mention all by name, but from the 16th century, John Tavener and Thomas Tallis stand out. Whilst moving into the Baroque period, Henry Purcell could be said to be one of the defining voices of that time. Purcell paved the way for acceptance of choral music, meaning that composers such as Thomas Chilcott, John Stainer, Hubert Parry, Arthur Sullivan, Edward Elgar, Herbert Howells, Ralph Vaughan Williams and Benjamin Britten could follow in his wake. Purcell is buried in Musician's Isle in Westminster Abbey, which is where the original organ of the church would have been located. Alongside him are the graves of Ralph Vaughan Williams and Herbert Howells, as well as memorials to Benjamin Britten and Edward Elgar. William Walton is also commemorated there, who is better known for his compositions for the coronations of 1937 and 1953 than anything choral, but he's worth a mention nevertheless. On the other side of the church is the grave of George Friedrich Handel, who could be considered the grandfather of English choral music. One of the anthems that he composed for the coronation of George II, Zadok the Priest, has been played at every subsequent coronation, and his oratorio Messiah 
is performed around the world every year. Contemporary composers of English choral music have taken inspiration from a range of subjects. Will Todd's Mass in Blue combines a jazz setting with a Latin mass. Roderick Williams used the centenary of the foundation of the Royal Air Force to create Per Adua Ad Astra, Through Adversity to the Stars. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that uh, lovely presentation about Westminster and the wonderful choral tradition in, uh, and composers in, in the UK. That was fantastic. Um, I know that the venue, the Westminster Abbey, holds a very special place in the hearts and minds of many of our directors here today. And uh, last month, we actually spoke with uh, Tom Little, the music director at Dublin's Christchurch Cathedral Choir. Um, he pointed out that he was somewhat fortunate since the choir's participa participation in cathedral services has, has somewhat returned. Um, Valda, I'm curious, do you know, are they currently doing services at Westminster Abbey? And if so, what, what do the, those look like right now? Yes, Sabrina, actually they are. Um, the Abbey Choir is um, singing even song. All the uh, services are going ahead, so visitors are coming to the, the church to, to, to um, attend the services. Um, also, it's open to visitors, locals, sightseers, and uh, to visit the Abbey as well. Um, they do need to pre-book. Um, and also organ recitals are taking place as well every Sunday. That's great to hear that there's there's uh, a musical life still vibrant in the yes, Abbey. Yes, yes. <laughs> Fantastic. And could you talk to us a little bit about um, the possibility of our touring groups or our choirs performing at Westminster? Yes, it is actually possible. Uh, when the Abbey Choir is on holiday, then it is possible for visiting choirs to sing even song. So choirs of up to around 50 choristers can apply by submitting a recording. Uh, and if they're able to sing even song, uh, they can sing a range of music from a Gregorian chants uh, right through to contemporary music. Um, but of course, anyone can visit the Abbey. Um, you can visit um, to attend a service or just go to the tour. Fantastic. That's great. Um, I think it's, as, you know, as Westminster is so prestigious and so beautiful, um, I think it's also great to talk about other venues in London that are possible for choirs to perform, choirs to orchestras, and there's a lot of them. So um, I understand that you put together a video um, compilation of some of the other venues that are open to performing ensembles. And Valda, would you be so kind as to introduce this video to us? Yes, um, of course, there are very many options, so it was extremely difficult trying to narrow them down and choose which ones to include for this video. Uh, we've ended up with five. We have three in London. We have um, St. Paul's Cathedral, where it's possible to sing even song. We have Southwark Cathedral, where it's possible for choirs or orchestras to uh, perform concerts during the day. Um, it's a lot easier to get into Southwark Cathedral, I might add, than it is uh, St. Paul's Cathedral. Uh, we also have Holy Trinity Church in Sloane Square, which is particularly good for very large choirs and orchestras because it's a very wide church. Uh, we also have St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh, which is very good for lunchtime recitals. And fifthly, we have King's College Cambridge, which we included um, Although it's not normally possible for a choir to perform there, uh, we do see it as a highlight of any group's visit to Cambridge. Uh, so we think that um, it's unmissable to see um, the choir sing um, in the chapel there. So, Serena, shall we play that video? <laughs> venues in London and the rest of Britain which we use regularly for visiting choirs. I am now standing outside Southwark Cathedral, the site of a place of worship since possibly the 7th century. One of the most colourful periods of the church's history was in the early 1600s when it was purchased by a group of merchants and was subsequently used by people involved in the theatre. Actors, dramatists and theatre workers such as Edmund Shakespeare, brother of William, are buried in the church, 
and John Harvard, who was born in the parish, was also baptised here. This is one of the most popular choices of venue for our visiting performing groups. The beautiful Arts and Crafts Church of Holy Trinity, here in the heart of Chelsea, was built between 1888 and 1890, and it's the venue that I most associate with choral concerts, as it's where my own choir has performed on numerous occasions. It has always enjoyed a reputation for high quality musical performances, and today it welcomes choirs from all over the world to perform. The church carries an important collection of stained glass windows, including designs by William Morris and Edward Byrne Jones. I'm standing outside St Paul's Cathedral. This iconic London landmark was designed by Christopher Wren after the previous building was destroyed by the Great Fire of London of 1666. Today, the cathedral is once again open to visitors who want to climb up to the outside of the dome to see spectacular views over London, or remain firmly on the ground whilst admiring the glorious interior decoration of the ceiling paintings and mosaics. The 19th century organ produces a rich sound that fills the vast space of the church. Previous players of the instrument are likely to have included Handel and Mendelssohn. The organ is widely used during services, such as Evensong, when high caliber visiting choirs are able to lead the singing. Outside of London, two of the highlights are usually St Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh and King's College in Cambridge. St Giles was founded in 1124 and in the 16th century became the focal point of the Scottish Reformation. The church is regarded as the mother church of world Presbyterianism and John Knox was minister here from 1560 until his death in 1572. The ministry of St Giles is enriched by the music performed during services and concerts throughout the year. Musicians come from all over the world to perform in this sacred space. And lunchtime concerts here are very popular with our groups, as a large, appreciative audience is more or less guaranteed. King's College in Cambridge was founded by Henry VI, who laid the foundation stone himself in 1441. It took just over a century for the spectacular building we see today to be completed and is recognised as one of Europe's finest late medieval buildings. From the outset, music has been an integral part of worship at King's and the choir and the chapel are inextricably bound together by a tradition that stretches back over the centuries and by a sound that blends the unique acoustic properties of the building with a continuous dedication to the pursuit of the highest possible standards in choral singing. Ah, oh, lovely. That was great. That was such a nice video. It made me want to travel <laughs> <laughs> right now. Uh, it's great to see that there's you know, so many wonderful options for performing groups. And that's just obviously the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's available in the UK. Um, but yeah, lovely to see those. Thank you. Um, I have many treasured, you know, personal treasured me memories from many of these venues. Uh, in Southwark Cathedral in particular, it's a very uh, special venue. We've had quite a few concerts there over the years and we actually interviewed the director of music Ian Heatley a few months ago as part of our virtual directors exchange. So uh, definitely a, a you know venue that's dear to our hearts for sure. So it's great to see that. Um, in, addition, in addition to more traditional venues such as churches, I know that there's a number of alternative venues for ensembles of all shapes and sizes 
And uh, Valda, I'm curious about some of your favorite hidden gems and um, other venues that you'd like to, to tell us about. Yes, well, we have a lot of venues around the country. Um, we deal with um, a lot of different types of groups. It's not just choirs and orchestras. They could be traditional fiddle players. It could be handbell ringers. It could be bagpipe players. So um, that's why we need a wide variety of venues because each group has its itinerary and the venues tailor-made particularly to their group. Um, to meet there, which is a need. We sometimes have um, joint performances as well with local groups, so we might be using venues that they're used to using. Uh, and this works particularly well um, in a lot of places, but in North Wales, I think that's probably one of my favourite joint performances. Uh, we have a, a male voice choir there where we have a very good relationship and it's extremely successful, not just from a musical perspective, but also from the point of view of a cultural exchange um, and fellowship which we try to organize after the concert so the two groups can get together and that really is a fabulous experience which I recommend to anyone. Um, as far as the venue is concerned I think probably one of my favorites would be St Helens in York because again that's very very successful it's a lovely church in the center of York we get a very warm welcome from the church itself but also a very appreciative audience. It's a very busy area, so generally we're quite successful with the audiences there. Um, but outside church, in cathedrals, we use a lot of different types of venues. They could be schools, colleges, hospitals, care homes, concert halls, um, castles. So for example, Warwick Castle, which is near Stratford-upon-Avon, um, it's possible for a quiet uh, concerts to be held in the Great Hall during the day or else Stirling Castle near Edinburgh. Um, and some choirs may not realize it's also possible to sing in the chapels of Hampton Court Palace and Windsor Castle. Um, and by the way, yes, I wanted also to let people know that if you um, don't have a sacred repertoire, that is not a problem in the UK because even churches and cathedrals are very happy to have um, a non-sacred repertoire. So if you've got Broadway songs, folk music, contemporary music, that's all fine for concerts in the UK, unlike in many parts of Europe. Great, that's that's actually really useful information to have, absolutely, because yes there's quite a few restrictions for many other countries. So There are, yes, yes. Yeah, so that's great to know. Thank you so much, that's uh, it's very inspiring. <laughs> Again, makes me want to travel. So. <laughs> Great. Um, in addition to arranging concerts and performances in the UK, we also have organized um, other events such as special master classes, talks with composers, and other kind of non-performing musical highlights. Uh, for example, in 2017, the Community Chorus of Detroit attended a choral masterclass led by John Rudder himself, which was obviously a very special event. Uh, Jill, could you tell us a little bit more about this exclusive experience and how it was organized? Yes, absolutely. Well, uh, first of all, just to say, of course, I'm sure all of you know uh, John Rutter and his work very well. Um, as you know, he's a famous composer, he's a conductor, um, he's a very good music arranger, um, and very often we find that choirs that do visit the UK, very often they have some of John Rutter's works as part of their repertoire, and that's always very much a highlight, people love John Rutter's music in this country. Um, so, um, you will know uh, a lot of his most wonderful pieces uh, and a, a lot of the choirs that visit the UK, they choose perhaps the most famous and, and popular hymns or, or anthems such as Look at the World or For the Beauty of the Earth or The Lord Bless You and Keep You, all these wonderful tunes, uh, beautiful music, the Gaelic Blessing. So very often they're performed and local audiences love that. So, for example, as you said, the Community uh, Choir of Detroit, um, we arranged a masterclass for them with John Rutter. Um, they happened to be performing some of his music as part of their repertoire. 
during their tour of the United Kingdom, they went to some wonderful places, gave some wonderful concerts. So we arranged the masterclass by, uh, first of all, John kindly agreed to travel from his Cambridgeshire home to London to be with the group and do the masterclass. Uh, and we booked a venue for them to do that. Um, we chose a beautiful place called the Grosvenor Chapel, which is in the heart of London in Mayfair. It has lovely acoustics. They have access to a piano and, a, and an organ. And basically, he ran through and rehearsed some of their pieces of music with them and was able to sort of inject some of his personal sort of interpretation, if you like. Um, so that was wonderful for them. It was a really glorious experience. And perhaps, you know, the main thing was that they got to meet someone who's pretty much an icon, certainly for us here in the UK. So that was very special. And they were able to hear a little bit about his life and connect with him a little bit, you know, so it was super exciting and, and, and very much a highlight. It was fantastic. Um, so um, we contacted, sorry, I just wanted to tell you, we contacted uh, John a few weeks ago when we were going, obviously we decided to do this webinar and he kindly agreed to answer some questions from Encore. Um, and he agreed to do a little pre-recording of those for us, especially for us. Um, and um, he also agreed to let us play some of his music and some of you will have noticed that the opening video, uh, the music was by, uh, for the opening video of this webinar, the music was by John Rutter, uh, and it was called The Cheerful Waltz. So uh, he kindly agreed to that as well. Um, so we'd love to play that recording. It's an absolute joy and uh, an inspiration. Um, so Sabrina, please play that video. We'd love to hear it. Hello, this is John Rutter speaking to you from my home in England, and I'm delighted to be part of this presentation. I'm a composer and conductor, and I've been asked some questions about my life and work. And uh, gosh, they're questions I've sometimes been asked before, but sometimes not. First one, I suppose rather obvious, is Am I writing any new music at the moment? I should have been taking advantage of the lockdown. Well, let me be honest and say that I haven't written any great pieces, but I have revisited quite a number of old ones and am presenting them in new forms. Some of my choral anthems are now made available as solo piano pieces, so you can play them at home. And my thoughts are turning to solo literature. I'm writing a guitar suite for a classical guitarist friend of mine in Spain. And I hope that that will work out all right. Guitar is a very difficult instrument. Of course, my thoughts have very much been with my musical colleagues and not just in the choral world. But the next question was, um, have I been able to work with the Cambridge singers? And the answer is just some of them and I have been preparing a choral learning aid, an app, um, which will enable people who are perhaps not terrific sight readers to be able to study the pieces that they want to learn. And so I've got what you could call a highlighted recording. Nine singers have met together and recorded one by one the voice parts for various of my pieces. There's 15 of them. The Cambridge Singers are not a regular choir that meets week by week. They're a freelance group of professional singers. And the next question was, how are they adapting? Well, of course, it's not easy because choirs can't really meet. Um, small groups can if they are socially distancing. Let's look forward to the day when we can all be together again. The next question was, will I be conducting in the future? Well, gosh, I do hope so. I've certainly done plenty of it in the past. And have I got plans to go to the USA? Um, yes, I've got it in my diary that I will be in Carnegie Hall conducting on Memorial Day next year, 2021. I very much hope to be there. How many times have I been to the States? Several hundred, probably. And I know that in Carnegie Hall in New York alone, I have conducted 127 concerts. And I just know that because they gave me a lovely party on the 100th 
and I have started counting again. So I have been a frequent and happy visitor, and incidentally it's where I found my wife, Joanne, brought her home here. Very flattering question, um, last really. Um, why do choirs in the world find inspiration, hope and comfort in my music? Oh gosh, I don't know, but I do set good texts from good sources, not least the Bible and Shakespeare and all the best authors. What should we be looking to when we all get back together again? And that was really the final thought. Well, I think we should be grateful for what we have taken for granted all these years. You often don't appreciate it until you lose it. And of course, this has been a very difficult time for all musicians, but maybe it's a chance to just refocus, reset, and think how fortunate we are that we have music and music making as the great joy of our lives. So, thank you to Encore in Boston for a great list of questions and happy travels. That was fantastic. He, I, I have to say, his his personality, his lovely personality, really shines through, um, even in that short video. And it was so, so kind of him to to do that and to to answer our questions and to just um, take the time out of his his I'm sure busy schedule to to do that. So um, yeah, lovely, very very nice. Thank you again for for organizing that. <laughs> It was very, very special. And I think, I think we all agree that, you know, what he said that, you know, we have this wonderful joy in our lives through music that even if we can't, you know, sing together or perform together as we, as we have been used to, um, it's something that we won't take for granted moving forward. I think that's a, a lesson that I've definitely learned in my life, just not taking things for granted that we, perhaps have in the, in the past. So um, yeah, that was, that was lovely. <laughs> I really enjoyed that and I hope everyone else did too. Um, so we would, we would love to take any questions that the audience has about, uh, about the John Rutter video, if there's any uh, questions about that or other venues in the UK or just and anything that you have on the the top of your your mind um i'll kind of you can uh, use the q a function to send them through to us um there aren't any at the moment but i will kind of i have a few questions that i thought we could start with um i'm curious rachel as as you are a you know a choir member yourself and sing regularly could you tell us a little bit about you know what rehearsals look like for you at the moment is your choir rehearsing um staying how are they staying connected probably won't surprise you to know that at the moment my choir aren't meeting physically um, we are following the government advice on that we were hoping that we would be able to resume rehearsals this term um, but unfortunately that hasn't been possible but what uh technology has enabled us to do is come together via platforms such as this such as zoom and actually uh, our conductor is putting on a series of musical talks and lectures for us um, which is enriching our musical knowledge and understanding and we all believe that when we come back together to rehearse hopefully uh, next term in the spring we will 
we will probably have an enhanced ability to perform thanks to this knowledge that we're we're hearing about and learning about each week we're interspersing it with socials as well we're having a few quizzes as well but it's 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 a way to sort of reconnect in a in a different capacity to how we would be doing things normally sure yeah i think i think that's a common theme among many choirs at the moment that they're you know doing things virtually and trying to stay connected and as you said, enrich their you know musical knowledge. I think that's that's great. So it's, it's a good thing to do until we can get together again. So well, that's great. Thank you for answering that question. No problem. Um, we've got two questions from the audience. Thank you so much. Um, the first, uh, let's see. Okay, so we have a question from uh, our participant Kay Redinger, um, and she's asking about. Uh, hearing listening to the webinar again and yes absolutely it will the recording will be up uh and uh by, by tomorrow on our website so you can watch it again no problem as many times as you'd like and you can share it with anyone that you think would be interested uh, and then we have a uh, from an anonymous attendee the question is how many cities would you typically include in a one week itinerary of England and Wales for performing choirs and what cities would you recommend? That's a great question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and uh, Valda or Jill, would you like to, to answer that question? Um, I don't mind answering that. Gosh, that's, that's uh, how long have we got? Um, <laughs> one, one week is quite short to include many cities, but I'm just thinking of the top of my head if you say seven nights then you could probably do uh, London, York and Edinburgh um, so fly into London and fly out of Edinburgh you wouldn't have time to do a circular route uh, but that would give you um, one or two beautiful concert opportunities um, in London we have a great venue in York and also it's one of the most important um, medieval cities in, in England so it's super important to visit but they you know we can also do a great concert there and then Edinburgh of course we've got St Giles so those would be three wonderful cities but there are lots of other options as well uh, of course so say, let's say three cities you could also do um, London, Oxford and Liverpool for example so three cities is probably about right for a seven night trip uh, it's still including a lot but Sorry, I did not talk too much. <laughs> oh no, that, that was great. That was great. Um, the the attendee that asked the question also wanted to know about Wales and if you wanted to do, for example, a, a tour of, uh, you know, including London and Wales, are the, which cities would you recommend for for that uh, for that itinerary? Wales, oh gosh, Wales, oh, Wales is beautiful. So if you're flying into London, you would go from London to Cardiff probably first. Cardiff is an absolutely glorious city, full of music. The Welsh are mad about music, as you know. Uh, they're singing all the time. If they're not singing, they're playing rugby. Um, but anyway, it's a wonderful <laughs> musical place. So London, Cardiff. It's funny with Wales because you've got so much beautiful countryside there aren't that many cities so you could do london cardiff possibly aberystwyth and then over to chester you could do that and aberystwyth is another beautiful place in wales on the west coast probably one of the most beautiful part, parts of the country uh, parts of wales because you've got the wet the sea and the the sunsets and lots of music so it's perfect so london cardiff aberystwyth Chester and you could even fly out of Manchester that would work really well. Fantastic thank you that's that's great that's uh sounds like a great itinerary and it's, it's great to talk about like possibilities and ideas you know there's so many but that's fantastic. <laughs> I've never actually been to Wales myself so I would love to go at some point <laughs> it's a new destination for me too. Uh, so we have another question thank you so much for all the questions. Um, the question is, how far in advance should we start planning for a visit to get the best venues booked? Ha, that's a great question. <laughs> I can answer that if you like. 
think it really to... depends on the venue um for the very best venues uh, somewhere like st martin in the fields which is almost impossible to get into i mean they have so few slots but that would be two to three years in advance um for somewhere like southwark cathedral a year in advance a lot of the slots will have gone but if we have a choice of over two or three days we might still be okay sometimes even at six months it might be possible with southwark cathedral um, but really any later than six months would be too late really um, so ideally a year if you can i know that's hard to think that far ahead but that's ideal for, for the average venue i would say that's that's very helpful yes and i i think um most of our, our groups do do start planning at least around a year in advance. So mm -hmm. um, that is a really good time frame to start planning for, yeah. for venues yeah. and for yeah. other venues yeah. as well. So St. Paul's would be a long lead in time too. That would be one to two years. St. Paul's, okay, great. Yeah, that's not surprising just because I'm sure there's, it's very highly in demand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, and we have another great question. Is it possible to do a residency for a choir? Yes, it is. Uh, there are several cathedrals around the country that do one week residencies, um, normally in the summer. Uh, so that normally means they will sing even song every day of the week. It could be seven times or it could be five times. It really depends on the cathedral. Um, so yes that is possible exeter for example we have organized a residency there recently and that worked very very well so they would base themselves in the city and then do day trips from there come back for even song so it really makes quite a nice um touring itinerary as well even though they're based in one place great yeah that's a that's a great option absolutely that's a really nice thing to to consider Yes, so I think a lot of groups, um, you know, obviously there's so much to see, you kind of want to go around, but if there is a group that's wanting to just kind of stay in one place and, and do that, that's a great option. So. Yeah, I mean, the UK is, is a small area, but there's an awful lot to see. So no matter where you're based, you can get to an awful lot of different places. I mean, if you're in London for the day trip, you can go to Oxford or Cambridge or Canterbury or Brighton or Stratford-upon-Avon um and many others as well the Cotswolds very easily in a day so you don't always have to be moving on great so, yeah that's a good point absolutely mm. yeah lots of options and for itineraries yes. and great ideas yes <laughs> well, wonderful um well thank you to those who submitted your questions those were those are great and i think kind of touched upon a lot of interesting points and possibilities for for lots of different types of groups uh so definitely something to consider you know to kind of think about all the options that that, that there are when you're planning a tour wonderful well i think this is we're kind of nearing the end of our of our webinars today and I would just love to, to thank you, uh, Valda, Jill, and Rachel, for, for joining us. It was so lovely to, to have you all here from, you know, live from London. <laughs> thank you for inviting you. us. Yeah, oh, thank you. Yeah. It was such a pleasure to have you all here and to hear your perspectives on, on touring and venues and all the wonderful options that there are in the UK. So thank you again. And I hope uh, that everyone enjoyed our visit to London today <laughs> and we look forward to seeing these special places in person hopefully very soon mm -hmm. and um, we it's, just, it's fun to think about travel and about the things that we all have in common that we you know we love travel we love music and that, that's you know something that's gonna you know keep us going and keep that joy in our lives so um, really lovely to be reminded of that so uh, until until next time, we hope you join us for the next Encore Live webinar, which will be coming soon. And I hope everyone has a lovely rest of your day. And um, from all of us at Encore Tours, thank you so much. Bye-bye.